Today's gospel is from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 3. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip ruler of the region of Ituria and Traconitus, and Lysanias ruler of Albaline, during the high priesthood of Cain of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So here we are, gearing up for Christmas, imagining that we'll steal away with Jesus, the babe asleep on the hay. Not so fast. The truth of Advent is that you cannot get to Jesus except by way of John. So this morning, as we do every year on the second Sunday of Advent, we make a stop at Checkpoint John. At this checkpoint, John does all the talking. You don't get to speak or defend yourself. You only get to listen to John's speech as your stomach tightens and you hold your breath, waiting to hear whether you'll be permitted to enter or even leave for that matter. So this morning, consider John. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was ruler of Galilee, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Luke doesn't focus on John's clothing or his diet, the locusts and wild honey. Nevertheless, Luke does see John as the culmination of the Old Testament prophets. Luke points out that John was of priestly lineage on both sides of his family. Luke tells us that the angel Gabriel promised to Zechariah that his son John will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before them in power and in the spirit of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. In today's reading, we hear how John, moved by the word of God, proclaims a baptism for the repentance and for the forgiveness of sins. How he foretells the coming of the Messiah. 
and how he prepares the way for the one who is the salvation of Israel. Fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. As the culmination of the age of the law and the prophets and the inauguration of the age of redemption, John serves as the hinge of history. A new child will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of the salvation to the people in the forgiveness of sins because of the tender mercy of our God. Thereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the ways of peace. Wow, such a gracious invitation, such a gracious role. Yet as we shall discover the way John accomplishes that role, matches a checkpoint demeanor. John is, after all, a baptizer. He calls his listeners to renounce the old government, the old life they are leaving. He says, you brood of vipers, sneaky, cunning, low-life, poisonous snakes. And we think, oh no, he's found us out. This entry point, this baptism is a deep either or. No compromise, no halfway, no vague boundary. It is lost or found, dead or alive, free or slave, obedient or accommodating. So which will it be? John's preaching of repentance turns people away from the top powers that be to the Lord, threatening those invested in the current state of affairs. We see this as Luke contrasts Tiberius, Pilate, Herod, Philip, Lysanias, Annas and Caiaphas, these powerful religious and secular leaders with the son of a small town priest. Luke focuses on the forces that will oppose John and the one who is to come. The forces who resist straightening paths and filling in valleys and bringing down mountains the forces that will ultimately lead to John's beheading and Jesus' crucifixion. Those who are threatened by repentance and forgiveness will not go without a fight. What are we who are so invested in the current state of affairs to do. Maybe we can get past the checkpoint if we offer John our credentials. Our dad and our dad's dad, the one who fought in the war, served the flag and paid his taxes on time. Our credentials and loyalty and privilege that go back 42 generations, clear back to Father Abraham. You remember Father Abraham, the father who believed the promise of God, 
yet seized a slave woman in order to have an heir. The father who was so generous that he gave the good land to his nephew Lot, even though none of it was really his in the first place. The father who, in a way we would now think as barbaric child abuse, risked his only beloved son in radical obedience. Yes, that father, we are his children. But John takes our credentials and tears them up. Not interested. At the Advent checkpoint, old inherited virtues and privileges and accomplishments don't count. It begins to dawn on us that entrance into this new system of governance is neither easy nor automatic. This savage response by the Border Patrol leads us to a hard thought. If not our inherited privilege, Christmas being such a wonderful middle class cultural virtue, what then? John responds with a stern imperative bear fruits worthy of repentance, act as though you've changed. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. This is not a list of stoic virtues. It's not a catalog of good deeds. This is evidence of a reorientated life. A life so trusting that the neighbor is no longer a threat or a competitor, but a partner in the building of a new community. Get on with it, says John, if you want to steal away with Jesus. Otherwise, warns Checkpoint John, you are not only excluded, but cut down and thrown into the fire. Everyone knows that Advent is an odd season, standing as we are at the checkpoint. We eagerly look to sweet Jesus and his gift of well-being. But we have work to do. The old patterns have failed. Our privileged access in the world is in jeopardy as hate grows commensurative to our fears and our sense of vulnerability. We are poised, like God's people are always poised, to move forward or turn back. The checkpoint haunts us because it reminds us that we could indeed be different, and the world could be different. But that involves transformation, that involves a change in loyalty, that involves a different governance. And all that can be rather costly. John comes preaching repentance and forgiveness. And the one who follows him, but who is greater than him, will do the same. Both end up dead. But their deaths and especially Christ's resurrection, will shake the foundations of Tiberius, Pilate, Herod, Philip, Lysanias, Annas, and Caiaphas, all seven of which are also dead. While Jesus and those who follow Jesus persist and flourish and will ultimately triumph so that all flesh shall see the salvation of God, including you. You who sit and listen to this reading about a nobody named John, 
You have been gripped by the word of God in the nowhere of the wilderness. And in the process, you are likewise mysteriously and powerfully included in the story of repentance, forgiveness, and salvation that begins here, but only ends with the close of the age John inaugurates. Which means that none of us have been there fully. Full justice, full obedience, full righteousness, full trust, full neighborliness, full obedience. We're still en route, still waiting, still pondering, still anticipating. What it will be like when our exile ends and we are home in a better, more hospitable place, making Checkpoint John, who calls us to repent and make a new beginning, crucial in bringing us to faith. As we wait for that day, when there'll be no more hurt or destruction, we are sent to proclaim in the spirit of John that in Christ the kingdom of God has indeed come. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.